Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. However, there have been a certain percentage of this volume of reports that have been made by credible observers of relatively incredible things. Very compelling evidence that we uh, we may not be alone. Whatever that means. flight characteristics appear to demonstrate advanced technology. Aero is the culmination of the decades of DOD intelligence community and congressionally directed efforts to successfully resolve UAP encountered first and foremost by U.S. military. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to not only Disclosure Team, but a live stream. I haven't done one of these for a good two months at least so good to be back doing them. Um, I am here actually in the US. I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina. So uh, it's good to be in the States. A um, couple of things before I bring on my guest tonight. You just saw the intro that I've been playing for the past few months. Just to go, let you guys know, I've been getting a lot of feedback on it. And I agree with a lot of you. It is a bit too long. So in the new year, in January, there will be a new intro coming. So for all you people that get frustrated to have to sit through just over two minutes of intro, there will be a new one. Um, for everybody in the live chat, thank you so much for being here. Please keep the chat respectful. You always do, and I appreciate that. And yeah, I think that covers everything. Oh, one last thing. I do put out all, all, excuse me, I do put out all of these interviews as an audio only podcast uh, over on Patreon you know, just to give a little something back to the people that support over there. If you did want to join the Patreon and help support Disclosure Team, it is only a dollar a month. Um, so there's that. But yeah, let's let's not waste any more time. I'm really excited for this conversation. Um, my guest tonight has been so busy doing so many things. And we just had a conference this past weekend. We're going to get into that. So please welcome back to Disclosure Team, Jay Christopher King. Jay, how's it going, man? It's great to see you, Vinny, and I love the intro. I thought it was Thanks. a great open. I mean, all two minutes of it. I, I was, I was really, I was really getting into it. I thought it was awesome. So I appreciate. I, that. I hear what you're saying, but I mean, I loved it. Thank I think you, you should keep it. I mean, it's one That's of those things, input. you know. A lot of people play like a two minute countdown. I thought, well, instead of a two minute countdown, I'll have a two minute intro. But then people were like, I love this. And other people were like, it's too long, man. And I'm like, ah. So I'm going to. Game please everybody. And it's got Kurt Patrick at the end. It needs updating. So, you know, I'll, I'll do a one Fair minute enough. with, uh, you know, some new faces, maybe some grush in there. We'll see. We'll sure. see. Sure. I mean, well, Kirk Patrick, he'll be part of history, you know, in in his own way within the field. So. I he think he's will. still highly relevant, you know? Yeah, sure. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's good to see but you, man. You too, man. And 
I want to jump in and talk about the conference that we had just this weekend past, the inquiry into anomalous experiences and the phenomena. Fall 2023 was December the 9th with, as always, an all-star cast of speakers. And um, I literally spent the entire day from the moment it started till the till the last end of the last speaker yes. just glued to the screen ordering in food i was here in rally obviously and it was just <laughs> it was incredible man um so i just wanted so to awesome. know you know as always you had like i said an all-star lineup but what were your what were your main takeaways from what you heard on the day anything that really stood out to you well i mean thanks for asking and it's it's nice it's wonderful to hear that Anytime that people are live streaming it and they're having their own immersive experience with it, I think that's fantastic. You know, what we've built into it over the course of the last 14 months, you know, it's it's our fourth in this series. And I'll, we've been building a lot more Q&A into the days. And I try to do the best job I can. I mean, as you see with the conferences, it's like I'm juggling, I'm spinning plates and juggling at the same time, like the whole day. But um, I really try to to bring in as much Q and A evenly between the people that are that are attending and people from the live stream, and I I try to read people's questions as close to what they wrote as possible. I mention people's names and I try to make them feel like they're a part of the experience as well. So I'm glad to hear that it was immersive, and I know that Rally is. I've spent a lot of time in Rally, and and Rally is an amazing food town. So getting yeah. delivery, I I can just imagine <laughs> the what that what that felt and tasted like. And so I'm glad to hear that. Um, as my main takeaways from the conference are, I was really pleased. One was like, okay, so the next morning, uh, and this is skipping ahead a little bit, but the next morning I was I was shooting with Alex Dietrich um uh for this show that I'm 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 working on and um and she was talking about how much she gained from the day um and I really appreciated that and it was something that she talked about on camera so I feel comfortable talking about it a little bit now um even though that's going to be out in months but I I deeply appreciate that we kind of ping pong between different mindsets and really trying to look at a wider scope than a lot of conference events do and trying to approach it in a responsible uh in a responsible way in a grounded way that still can kind of like talk about more esoteric subjects and bring in those kinds of ideas you know um but i i, I think that it's heavily appreciated so you know we started the day with joshua cutchen who wrote this Book, this amazing book called the ecology of souls uh, and volume two is really about kind of like the overlay of ufos and and the paranormal and like the afterlife and different conceptions of those topics like over the course of many many centuries throughout world cultures and so he kind of like it's like he took passport to magonia and, and was like okay this needs to be like a whole genre of, <laughs> of literature basically right and so you know uh, going from him, going from someone like to him to Tim Gallaudet, yeah. you know, a former Rear Admiral in in the Navy who was talking about uh, USOs and and like why we need to be looking into in our oceans more, and going from him to Leslie Kane and and uh, Alex Dietrich before lunch, that felt like totally classic and germane to what we do and what makes what we do special to me anyway and so the the takeaway for me is just like being able to push all those buttons and being able to do it in sequence so that it hopefully jogs people into kind of like new states of for themselves not telling what people what to think at all but like trying to open up a field so that people have their own aha moments that they feel are completely their own and it's just from drawing data points between these disparate speakers. Does that make sense? It does totally make sense. And I, I picked up on the, some of that a bit that I realized, you know, we had Alex Dietrich sat down with Leslie Kane and that was a great conversation. And then later on with Diana Pasolka, and it's like two very prominent and well-respected female individuals associated with the subject at the same place, but coming from such a different angle. It was amazing. And 
I think it was great because I think Alex recently sort of said that she was making an effort to re-engage with the UFO topic and community a lot more going forward. And I mean, that's just something I think we've all hoped for secretly for a long time because she was always, you know, she'd dip in and out and you'd see her crop up here and there. But it does seem like she's, you know, right, I'm all in kind of thing. And, and, and that's exciting. And the fact that you were filming with her for your project, which we will talk about uh, a bit later on, is just exciting. So... Yeah, I mean, amazing conference overall, as always. Um, I, you know, it was just well put together. And you mentioned there about the Q&A. And I've been to a lot of conferences this year where they've, you know, done Q&As at the end of, of speakers' talks. And it's been really difficult to see that time management because speakers always go over and and then it's like not making the whole day go over. And so I have to congratulate you on doing a stellar job with keeping the timing and, and that. And I liked how you were you know keeping the audience under control in your in a humorous <laughs> but, but firm way it was amazing i tried i tried you know it's i i tried different hand gestures there's a lot i try I, and i still haven't found the perfect formula but i'm sure that you know through the trial and error process over the years i'll learn how to get people to shut the heck up in a, a really quick <laughs> amount of time it's gonna be awesome I'm sure you will, man. I can't wait to see that process progress. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But listen, while we're talking about conferences, you obviously you attended the Sol uh, Foundation sort of inaugural symposium, which you know was Good. seemed like it was quite a, a, an awesome event, very pertinent to what's happening at the moment. And it's uh, you know, it seems mm -hmm. that. I mean, I know you've spoken about this on a few other podcasts, so we don't have to go into too much detail. But it seems we're having this I'm new emergence of a, a new type of conference from what we have seen for, for decades in the UFO community, which has been, you know, filled with great speakers, but maybe, maybe it was getting a bit tired. And, and we're now seeing this kind of academic, scientific, serious approach to, to the, the conference scene. Do you think that was something that was, you know, we were crying out for and it's needed now? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think that having more a wider array of people and having more serious thought uh, in a more grounded way and even a more philosophical way or, uh, you know, there are a lot of different kind of academic traditions to bring into anomalous studies and ufology. And it's been happening more recently. Like I've seen more anthropologists kind of like becoming really interested in the field. I think that's fantastic. I've seen more philosophers being really interested in the field. I think that's great too. Um, obviously for, for a while now with people like Jeff and Diana, we've had some serious interest from the religious studies community and because there is a, this longstanding, um, this longstanding study of esoterica and kind of mysticism within religious study and so it doesn't even have to be the whole like ufology is a new religion it can really be about just kind of the wider topic of the appreciation of just how weird the world is right and and that has been a safe haven um uh within religious studies for quite a while so it's it's good to see that that kind of growing and i think anthropology is perfect for, for that as well, because there's a long standing history within world cultures and anthropologists when they do field work to just kind of like report what other people report and just lay it down without any kind of judgment call about, about uh, whether something's true or false, or it's more about like, what's the understanding of the people that are, that are there and, and trying to do it in an unredacted way, in an unredacted fashion. And so I've been really happy to see the amount of anthropologists that have been joining the field too. But back to your question about the, the conference scene, absolutely. You know, I think it was great. It's been amazing to see Jeff's Archives of the Impossible conference series down in Houston. That helped inspire our conference series in New York, um, which is just kind of like for different reasons. And now with Seoul, you know, that has its own bent too. And uh, of course, it's great that Jeff has his kind of pocket down at Rice yeah. in terms of the social sciences and looking, for, looking at it from a, a more straight academic social sciences pr perspective. And that Gary and Peter, they're, they're baking in the social sciences too, but they have a lot more hard science going in, right? And so there's, there is, so it's interesting because Seoul kind of feels like there's, some of archives built into it and a bunch of SCU built into it. 
Yeah. And then it just have and then having it at a place like Stanford just makes it so much more heightened. You know, when you have when you have conferences like this starting to happen at you know, really prestigious academic institutions like Rice and Stanford, people tend to take notice and it tends to shift the tenor of the conversation. And I deeply appreciate that. You know, I don't have my own academic institution to like throw conferences mm -hmm. at. Um, and so I, for myself, I, I appreciate kind of having a similar strategy in terms of the curation, but I like feeling like it's more like the living room of our community and that sure. I can, that I can bring kind of heart to it and humor to it, but especially mindfulness thought and, and heart in a way that can be a little bit more challenging for some of the more hard science derived conferences that have been popping up lately. Yeah, no, great answer. I agree completely. Now, one person that was at the soul that I and I think a lot of other people were intrigued to hear from, not that we have yet if we didn't attend, but Carl Nell obviously gave this mm -hmm. uh, presentation and we, we got to see that that kind of leaked slide about this controlled disclosure potential plan leading up to 2034, I think it was. So uh -huh. quick fire question, controlled disclosure or catastrophic disclosure? <laughs> well, I mean... I, okay, A, I met Carl Nell that morning. We took the bus over together, and it was a private bus. It wasn't like we took a public bus over. <laughs> um, it was a shuttle bus, but like uh, it was a pretty amazing experience uh, meeting him that morning and just being like, oh, my gosh, you're Carl Nell. And it was kind of a mind blower. Uh, really nice guy um, in, in talking with him. And so that kind of framed my understanding of the presentation that I saw. And I think that it's important to mention, you know, that, I don't want to f run afoul of Gary and Peter's rules for the conference. And sure. so like, I, I might be a little bit oblique about my answer, but of course. you know, when people for that timeline that people were mentioning overall with, you know, there are various variations of timelines that people were kind of pushing forward. And I think what's a, some of the important things to recognize is that some of those important things to recognize are that, everybody understood that this was a reality that needed to be put out for people and that it was it, it was most about like how do we do this in a responsible way and it yeah. didn't feel to me from anybody's perspective that it was that it was based in the land of like we need to hide this for advantageous reasons it had more to do with how do we do this without giving people aneurysms and you know what i mean having them bleed from the eyes uh with like the revelations that are about to come out <laughs> and and so it was it was a little bit more along those lines and so you know it's important to recognize i think that that catastrophic disclosure the definition that was kind of put forward at the conference was much more about like it was it was if we leave this to the nhi themselves or we if we leave this to adversarial nations nation states um, if we let, you know, say, not we, but, you know, the U.S. military and industrial complex right. and government, etc. If we if if we let um, China or Russia or somebody else do it first, that would be that could be potentially catastrophic or the NHI themselves. It could be catastrophic. Those were the two use cases that were mentioned for catastrophic disclosure, which is a really interesting thing to try to wrap your head around because like the, it wasn't I think that it was misunderstood online that term in general and thinking that the that if you put those two words together it means that disclosure is going to be catastrophic and I don't think that anybody was was I don't think most people there were trying to intend to to portray the idea that that a rollout of of disclosures on multiple fronts and to multiple audiences and in multiple frameworks um, it is a bad thing. It was it was about it being a necessary thing. So in that way, you know, I um, I can understand that to a degree. Um, uh, there are a lot of uncomfortable truths about these topics. There are challenging aspects to these topics. And I don't think that things should be hidden from people. And I think mm. that time, I do think that time is of the essence. You know, I think that 
we're at a really challenging point in human history where, you know, a lot of hard scientists, we listen to hard scientists all the time about certain things, but then when it comes to things like the environment, we don't want to listen to that at all. We want to act like, oh, that's fake. You know, even if 90% of them are telling us one thing, you know, we'll just act like, we, you know, we'll hit the recycle button on that, on that impending trauma, you know? And, yeah. and so I think it's important to recognize that it, some of this, infor- that a lot or all of this information needs to get out in a quick time frame because I think, I think, human civilization needs to grow up and it needs to, and it needs to take responsibility, more responsibility for this amazing planet that we have. And that I think that, that the realization that, that there are other civilizations out there uh, or in here even um, could, could be one of the few things that could kind of slap people awake um, fortunately or unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. And what I find interesting is that I see a lot of people online on social media sort of saying, well, we're not ready for the truth. Or what if the truth isn't what we want it to be? What if it's actually quite a negative thing? And my response is always kind of like, look, we, we, we have to adapt to no matter what the truth is, if we ever get it for what the phenomenon represents, you know, we need to get past that hurdle to be able to evolve ourselves as a race you know what how would you how how would you sort of react to that kind of comment what would you say to someone who who said we're not ready um i would say that that has been the barrier to progress with this topic for over 70 years and i think that that's it's the same i think it's a similar uh point a similar pushback that we've been hearing since donald kehoe's first books in the early fifties and, and they, whoever they are, have been using that playbook ever since. And Kehoe accurately pointed at some of the same structures that have been keeping those same secrets for that length of time. And like the secrets have only gotten more vast over time as materials have been collected and better understandings of, of some of the stuff has, has seemingly taken place. That said, you know, it's important to recognize that, that hammers only see see nails, you know what I mean? Within the context of things like this. And so if if somebody's looking at stuff from just a national security perspective, there's probably a lot about aspects of the phenomenon, the range of non-human intelligence that we may be encountering that could, you know, fly completely over the head of the military industrial complex altogether because it's more interested potentially in like the cool cars that they drive (laughs) rather than like then and like the intentions of some of those beings than things that are maybe a little bit more non-physical to us that may have a lot of impact actually but are harder to wrap one's head around um, than you know some recovered craft or something like that so uh, at the end of the day like i think that the the idea that we're not ready we have to be ready like we're not ready for there's a lot that we haven't been ready for there there's we haven't been ready for you know these these horrible kind of bureaucracies and 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 structures that we live under um we haven't been ready to kind of face how problematic they've been for us sometimes and how much they lie to us so much right but like people know at the end of the day people know all you have to do is open up twitter or youtube or any form of social media and you can tell how much money is spent on trying to suppress the idea that we've been misinformed on like a global scale by by different governments and and different companies and different contractors and all this stuff around the world for for many decades and so people are, I think people are ready because they do know a version of the truth, which is that we've been fed a bunch of BS for quite a long time. Yeah, it seems to be as well that we've had a lot of focus this past year on the kind of government and the intelligence community, you know, and, you know, hats off to David Grush for coming forward and, and kind of putting himself on the line, you know, and that's been great and everything. But I think, and this is something I just mentioned to you before we came on air that you know i 
feel like it's the experiencers who have had to kind of take a back seat now for a few years. And I think it's enough's enough. I think it's time for them to come forward. I've been trying to have more conversations with experiencers to try and understand it a bit more for myself. And I can tell you, I, I don't understand a lot of it, but it's really good to kind of hear firsthand from these individuals who are credible uh, and they're honest and truthful and, you know, they're not crazy and they're not psychologically impaired necessarily you know this is things that have really happened and i'm starting to find myself becoming more and more intrigued with that and keeping the government side of things completely here next to me and focusing on it but just having this whole new conversation so how can we bring the experience of back into the conversation as a as a community or how do Mm -hmm. we kind of bring them back into even the media as well like we need to elevate them back up in my opinion do you think that's something that that, that's going to happen or is possible I think it's I think it's necessary and I I think that it's one of the smartest things we could possibly do partly because you know this weekend he wasn't on stage but we did film with him Greg Bishop who wrote the wonderful book Project Beta on yeah. government misinformation and disinformation campaigns specifically through the what the horrible stuff that happened to Paul Benowitz and kind of focusing on that um you know if you look at things from that that world if if you're depending on learning about what's going on with regard to NHIs and all you're listening to are people that, you know, are paid to lie to people or are paid to keep secrets, you're going to have a lot of challenges. It's going to be a hall of mirrors. It's, it just is. And but if you listen to the experiencers and if you really you don't have to listen to every experiencer, you don't have to believe every experiencer you don't have to try to wrap your head around every experiencer but i I personally of course i mean it almost goes without saying but i think that that listening to experiencers it puts you it, it makes your head it puts your ear to the ground it puts you closer to the truth because you're you're getting closer to where the action actually is when it, where it's unmediated where it's unprocessed and it's unspun it's not being it may be spun and co-created by the human mind, which tries to make a beginning, middle, and end to every story for the purposes of understanding how time works. There is that mm-hmm. element. And I think that that's like the prismatic like situation that can confound people when they're talking to experiencers sometimes. But that said, you're going to get closer to to an as you're going to get closer to the truth if you're actually just talking to the experiencers, in my in my humble opinion, because other people are paid to make up stories whereas whereas with the experiencers they didn't even ask for these stories to come into their lives often in the first place good point yeah nancy here raises a good point what if the government knows they are nefarious they take our sperm and eggs why that's a great question nancy and you're right i mean i think one thing that's important to recognize is that that we're probably dealing with much more than just one group. I think that it's, that it's, I would put it at a very, very high probability. I'm not going to say a hundred percent because I don't like to talk and always and never, but we're, we're looking at more than one group almost certainly. And, and given that and more than one type of intelligence, but you're right, Nancy, that there has been for at least, you know, 40, 50 years, seemingly been one group, at least, that has been abducting people and has been doing medical experimentation on them. And like, as anybody that knows, that has known about my case for a while, um, the, the reason I became a public person in many ways is because Ralph Blumenthal uh, wrote in the debrief about me as an abductee case. Um, the first time that that happened was when I was about 10 years old, as I can recall. And so that that issue specifically is very close to my heart for a lot of reasons. I don't mention it often in podcasts because I recognize that for some people, they're just their brain turns off when mm-hmm. they hear about that. But it is a reality. And when, you know, it's difficult when we hear even on say like the Senate floor earlier today with Schumer and rounds, they were talking about uh, recovered material. They were talking about the possibility of recovered biologics. 
And as folks have, have heard from me in the past, if those if some of those recovered biologics match exactly those gray beings that have, that that abductees have been reporting for decades, there's a, a serious amount of reckoning that needs to happen on the on on the part of our common culture, popular culture, and especially the people that are being paid to protect us in this world, I think. And and I, I think it's an incredibly serious issue. And, you know, I heard some backpedaling, you know, bless Colin Kelleher. I like Colin Kelleher. I love talking with him. I, I hung out with him for a while at archives earlier this year. We had a great conversation about poltergeist activity. It was awesome. Um, I really enjoyed reading his book with Lukatsky and, and Knapp uh, just earlier this season. And then, you know, I also heard him recently, he just did a podcast and appearance and he was talking about, oh, you know, if the, the biologics, we're going to have to keep them hidden for a while because if they have, if they, if there's some aspect where they might have, um, uh, they might be able to spread disease or infectious agents or something like that to us, then that would be a huge national security secret. And we, we should probably keep them, we should probably hold that back. And I was just thinking to myself, and at the same time, he was saying like, oh, I'll like, I'm comfortable, you know, speaking to, to, you know, coming out and, and speaking on the record to Congress or something like that, if I think that it's going to go anywhere. Right. And, and those are, you're talking out of two sides of your mouth in a situation like that <laughs> to a degree. And like, again, like I like the guy quite a bit, but this idea that, that there could be something infectious within somebody. So it's a national security secret. That doesn't mean that you can't just release a photo of the damn thing. Of course. Right. And, um, and so there's a logic leap there that, that to me is fishy. It, and like, I don't, I would prefer for that kind of rationale and that talking point to go away because I personally, I find it completely absurd. See, one thing I struggle with is that since Grush came out and mentioned these biologics, these beings that have been retrieved in these, these crash retrievals is, you know, my, I always jump between which theory or hypothesis I'm kind of being pulled towards at that time, whether it's the interdimensional, the, the crypto, maybe it's some kind of artificial intelligence that we're dealing with that's so far advanced than us. But then you bring back in biologics, it makes me go kind of almost back to the ET hypothesis. I'm forever kind of jumping around going, and what is this that we're dealing with? And that becomes kind of frustrating sometimes. So how do we kind of... Where do, how, what do we do with this, these different, these buzzwords and these potential origins for this NHI? Like, how do we deal with it? Where do we focus? You know, because it seems like we get stuck on one, like, yeah, it, it's really looking like they're crypto terrestrial. They've been here forever. But then something <laughs> yeah, yeah, comes yeah. out and you're like, oh, well, that doesn't fit with that. And then we're over <laughs> on the other side. It's like, well, what's going on? Uh-huh. No, I, I absolutely agree with you. And I think that, though, I think that there's an overlay that, that I can I can definitely appreciate where there are some things that seem fundam that seem f fundamental to a lot of the landscape, like literally and figuratively, uh, with with these issues, where you know we have we have something that doesn't share all of our DNA, uh, that that is usually portrayed as bipedal. There are very different understandings of of some of what that looks like and we have this idea from valet and others that and even nolan that there can be kind of a manipulation of our perception to sure. make us see things that aren't exactly what that thing is so whether that's because of what people used to think of in native traditions and in other traditions as shape-shifting, or whether that's a non-human intelligence that has the ability to hack our own perception, or right. both, you know, there, there's that as well. And so I think that given those kinds of states of play and that what we hear over and often from, from experiencers and other officials that, you know, that hint towards like, Oh, they think this place is theirs. Like, oh, who's you know? I was just watching the 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 uncut Ross Coltart uh, Gary Nolan interview that sure. came out yesterday um, for, that they shot about a year ago, and 
you know, Gary was mentioning in it that that these things that UFOs, UAPs are often seen over over nuclear bases, which you know you and I know very well. But that uh, you know he was bringing up the point of of who's to say that you know why why would these things why would these craft why would this non-human intelligence obey our understanding of private property essentially i'm paraphrasing here if it didn't if it thought that the idea of private property or that we owned that particular area was absurd you know i mean there's and that points towards something that people have been hinting at for many many years which is that at least one of these nhi groups feels that they have ownership over the domain that we have and so regardless of where they come from they feel like this is, you know, this could be like the U.S. Virgin Islands or something like that to them, right? And so, to, no matter whether they're extraterrestrial or they're interdimensional or they're cryptoterrestrial, like at the end of the day, some of these NHI seem to, according to very high place sources and experiencers themselves, seem to think that they that this is actually their domain and we just happen to be existing on it. Yeah, you that know, almost points to that they have. That, that, that we are theirs to just pluck out of our homes and go and experiment on or take away, you know, it, it, to that extreme. And that's quite sure. worrying, scary. It It is quite worrying. It is quite scary to think that that we, you know, I, I remember a specific quote from somebody who I can't name, but, but this person was a high-placed person and they're retired now as far as I know. And they they were suggesting that, you know, some, at least one of these groups thinks of us as property. And, and that made, you know, other people in the room that this person was presenting like pretty queasy, right? Um, for good reason, for good reason. Now at the, uh, on the same, uh, by the same token, there are other intelligences that people communicate with through states of meditation. You know, for example, Diana Pasolka wrote this great book called Encounters that just came out that really talks about how there seems to be a collective, like a con people can adopt contact protocols, they can meditate and they can have telepathic experiences that can help inspire them even. And that great inventors, as she even mentioned in American Cosmic, that a lot of the great inventors feel that they were inspired by external influences. And I don't think that those agents are necessarily the same thing. I think that that's probably a different, that's probably a different mechanism. That's probably overall a different non-human intelligence that, that, that is provoking such interactions. So, you know, I think it's important to recognize that there's a landscape here and that we don't have to be worried about all of these situations. And there are some, probably some, some good guys baked into this that are trying to help us out. And I know that I'm like way out on the ledge here, but I yeah. feel kind of more emboldened than usual to be able to kind of speak on this a little bit. And, and at the same time, you know, yeah, there are definitely others that feel, seem to feel free to, to experiment medically on us. And do they do this quite as much as they used to? It's hard to say. Um, that's a common question these days. It's like, why do we hear about all these cases from the 90s and the 80s? And why do we not hear from more recent cases? And from my own experience, it's partially because there's a huge lag time between when something happens to somebody that's traumatic and when they feel willing to talk about it. Sure, yeah. And and so there there's a huge lag time there. And from, you know, uh, directing and ha and you know running the experiencer group with Robin Lassiter and Trevor Shikaze now um we we see that people are still having what people think of as abduction experiences um are are they as does it happen as often as it used to it's hard to say mm. you know and there seems to have been a long form experiment that that people may be there may be an aspect where people are still getting picked up every once in a while. You know, one thing that, I, you know, just along those lines before I shut up about this topic for, for the moment, but have, since you ask, um, you know, there's, there's this old idea that I kind of talked about with Ryan a couple weeks ago where 
where experiencers back in the old days, there's there's a whole era of ufology where if somebody saw an occupant, then their case would get thrown out. And then there was a whole era where if people had more than one encounter, they were called repeaters and their cases were thrown out because that was seen as highly improbable. That would be like getting hit by lightning twice or something like that. Whereas what we now know is seems to be more the case is that that as far as like the abductee cases, it's not usually a one and done situation. This is more about a system of monitoring and over a course of time. And that may be super uncomfortable or challenging for people to understand, but it's it's just the damn truth. Now, in, along along those lines, you know, there. So who's to say like there was an initial pool of people and then and then now as people get older, maybe things don't need to happen as frequently, you know. So anyway, this stuff still happens. They don't seem to be all bad. There does seem to be a, a very challenging aspect to the one the more nefarious aspects of it, though, for sure. Right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And where does my labs fit in with all of this? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to go there. Uh, okay, that's a great question. I mean, um, you know, without mentioning any specific names, because it tends to be bad for people's health, you know, there's, there's, um, I think that there's something to that. Okay. In fact, I would, I would, I would be, I would go so far as to say that I I'm certain that there's something to that. Um, it's very, very challenging yeah, for a lot of different reasons. Um, I think that it's hard because a lot of people can't kind of wrap their heads around like who's actually doing it and like how much money it would take to do it. And like, where's the funding coming from? And like, and why do they seem to have such advanced technology? And there seems to be something of that that I can't fully explain myself at all. Sure. But I do recognize that there are certain, especially certain abductees that then have these kind of follow up encounters with humans or near humans that um, kind of seem to do their own follow up testing and analysis. And, you know, there are there are some old theories about why that is that that have not been like broaching public consciousness lately, partially because David Jacobs is retired. John Mack isn't with us anymore, but Hopkins isn't with us anymore. Carla Turner isn't with us anymore. Things like that, right? P folks like that who, who all did great work in their own ways. You know, I have, I have some issues with some of what Jacobs did. And, but um, you know, I think that he did collect really interesting data that, mm. that he, Personally, I think he interpreted poorly for the most part, right. but there, but there is some, but there is some truth baked in there. So that said, you know, there's this old idea through people like Jacobs that some experiencers with these, some abductees may have had um, some kind of like programming built into them, or these implants may have something nefarious going on with them where and and i it's challenging for me because it's it's very very difficult to not think of of somebody that goes through that like myself as a victim in a situation like that and then there's this spin factor where where somebody else says well that doesn't a abductions don't occur b if they did, we'd have to get to the bottom of it and see those those victims. They might actually be sleeper agents of some form that we don't understand yet. And that actually seems to have been the actual rationale of, of some of these groups or some of the, the chatter associated with those groups. Now, that's like it seems like one of those things where it's like that's too hot for TV. But this is a conversation that's like 30 years old and Indeed. like and. And it's and it's important for people to to recognize that and kind of like dig into it and actually read the books, you know, because there's a lot there. Um, but you know, I think that increasingly over the next few years, it'll be important for people to 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 push that button and really think about the situation of people that have been picked up, um, because 
the idea, this whole focus of like, oh, there's something in the sky and we don't know what it is. Well, that was a lie because we have them. We have the dang crafts, right? And then they're like, we don't know where they come from. And it, Oh, but there's biologics. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh, there's biologics, right? And so it's just this layers, these layers of like, I don't know. And it's like just title 50, the whole freaking thing, man. Yeah. Like, yeah. like there's, there's definitely fire. There's not just smoke, there's fire. And, and the, and the, the hard reality that part of the slow roll in my, from my perspective that I've been like very quiet about saying is that, that they're slow rolling part of this because they don't want to acknowledge abductions. That's just the plain, simple fact of the matter. Yeah. I agree completely. And this is why it was for the last couple of years, I was like, we've got to focus on the government. I understand we've got to take it step by step. But I, I just, I thought, you know, all these people, they must feel unwanted, unheard, and all of these things. And my intrigue was just growing and growing and growing. And then from having conversations with experiences over the past few months, I found that it's actually added to how I think about the other areas of the topic that I have focused on while mm -hmm. not ignoring experiences, but not shifting my focus completely onto them. So I think it's actually sure. helped me in the bigger picture. And so I would recommend mm -hmm. to anybody out there, go and have that conversation. And, and I think it's important as well that I realize that I don't have to believe what they're saying, but I can clearly see that they believe what they're saying. And I respect that ultimately at the end of the, the day or the end of the conversations that I've been having. So yeah. I think it's, I think it's time. I completely I, think it's time. I appreciate that. Thank you. No. And, and, and again, like if people don't want to wrap their heads around that, I'm not, I don't want to feel like they're it's forced down their throat. There are many avenues oh. for how, for how people can, can, try to wrap their heads around anomalous studies and ufology in general without going straight for the most challenging aspects of it. Though I think that as a culture overall, you know, part of the reason why people are like, okay, then we do this, then we do this, then we do this. It's partially about that at the end of the day. It's not about people's heads exploding at the idea that there is another species out there or that we might even have their craft. It's more about the inconvenient truths of like how that interaction has actually happened and what people have actually known about it for decades at this point. Sure. Yeah. And that's what I would say to people is, you know, I'm not expecting everyone to, I'm not telling anyone to go out there and do what I did, but everyone has their own pace, takes their own steps. I came from the nuts and bolts, went more into the woo over time now speaking with experiences other people may come from being an experiencer and then the woo and nuts and bolts might be the last thing they find so everybody has their own angles directions and paths so i'm just saying mm -hmm. i found Absolutely. mine and I'm, and I'm enjoying in this new direction so and this is Love something it. that i hope we'll be seeing from i'm going to say it right on tocalypse productions you got forward. it <laughs> hey all right so, good tra transition before we get into that, I want to play this 35 second teaser that, that that is out on YouTube, if you don't mind. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. Okay. Let me just play this for people just to whet the appetite a little bit, you know. Oh, I love that. Thank you. Get into it. That's cool. That's Here great. we go. Yeah, yeah you, you got, got it. it. I love it. Oh. Excuse That's me. That's right. Autoplay on YouTube just goes into crazy stuff. But yeah, I mean, that's just a nice little teaser. And for everybody that wants to learn more, the link for Ontocalypse. Oh, see, I knew that was going to happen. Ontocalypse. The link is in the Ontoc description. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But listen, Jay, I, tell us how, how uh -huh. it came about, what it's all about, sure. what you're aiming to do. Because, you know, from I was lucky enough to like be at the conference at the weekend where you actually played the mm -hmm. first trailer for the docu series. And oh, my that's goodness. Right. Yeah, let's get into that. <laughs> <laughs> I know that was a fun surprise. I was really burning the midnight oil to get that together, by the way. <laughs> there's a there's a pretty cool two minute trailer that using some clips from some people that we've already interviewed with. Um, but the I, the idea behind on was to have uh, a media production company that could tackle various projects and really support people in the space that are trying to do pretty high level work. Um, and uh, one of the initial projects is that um, Kelly Chase of the UFO Rabbit Hole and I are co-writing and um, are co-writing a series together called uh, The Beyond UFOs and a New Reality that'll be premiering next year. 
it's a docu series. So the current plan is three episodes, three long episodes. Um, and we have already interviewed, um, gosh, uh, Diana Pasolka, Alex Dietrich, Paul H. Smith, Mike Masters, Joshua Cutchin, Jeff Kripal, Whitley Strieber, Ia Whiteley, um, wow. Greg, Greg Bishop, Keith Taylor, a bunch of folks. Uh, Leslie, I, I did I did some, some interview stuff with Leslie. We'll, and um, and there'll be more later. But um, we're going to be talking to more folks. So it's a pretty it's a pretty awesome cast uh, for the show, uh, I'd have to say. <laughs> oh, and yeah. uh, and um, it wasn't easy to pull all that together. But um, uh, so there was kind of this think tank session uh, a friend of mine named jordan flowers um he lives up in connecticut and he was i have seen him at ufo supper clubs he's come to all the conferences and i've actually met him james and i met him for lunch one day james and dolly and i uh, met him for lunch one day this was like last summer mm-hmm. and he was having some ideas about he has he went to columbia business school and he has a history of kind of helping not no, not necessarily funding things himself, though he does sometimes, but more about like structuring investors and then structuring and investments. And he's of the strong opinion that 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 um, and Kelly and I are as well, being the three principal partners in Ontocalypse, that you uh, that ufology and anomalous studies in general needs more funding and more money in general because in general we've had this idea for years that. A, if anybody receives money within ufology, that it somehow taints them. And but B, sure. what we see here is that people like you and I and and everybody around us in the community, uh, this is like their second or their third job, right? That they're either independently wealthy or they're burned out, or they're burnouts because they 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 burn themselves out by like going to work, coming home and trying to put out a podcast or trying to write a book or doing this or that or the other thing. And, and as Avi Loeb, you know, puts it, and I think other researchers might be more on the right, more on the pay dirt track than Avi himself, but Avi has a great line about how, you know, extraordinary claims require extraordinary research and extraordinary research requires extraordinary funding. And I think that that's absolutely true. I think that's absolutely true. And so um, we've been working on kind of strategies so that we can fund really, really interesting projects within the space with some of the top minds and some of the people that are that are kind of that have already that already have a great, great track record within the space. And so one of the starting with a couple easy projects are this docu series that Kelly and I are, are co-writing and we've been working on and I'm directing and Jordan's an EP on it, an executive producer. I am Kelly is and this other guy, Teddy Jones is an executive producer on that. We've been having a lot of fun with it. We started shooting it right after soul um, in Palo Alto. And so that trailer that you saw was just like with like four of the five interviews that we had done at that point. And since then, just this week, um, just in the last week, we did. N- we brought nine more people onto the cast for the show, so I've been burning the midnight oil since that trailer even uh, <laughs> got put out. But another project that 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 we've done recently is this wonderful philosopher named James Madden um, recently put out a book called Unidentified Flying Hyperobject. Yeah. And it's a brilliant, brilliant book that really looks at kind of Jacques Vallée's work and Pasolka's work and many other people's work in, in a philosophical framework and, and trying to understand this idea of the hyper object, which is kind of like the hyper object in general is, is any kind of system or thing that is too big for the mind to wrap its head around in very simple language. And so if you're trying to understand like, that like the idea that the financial market is is too big for for some for most people to to comprehend right or like how the ecosystem works you know what i mean like how oxygen and carbon dioxide and whatnot completely balance out over the course of our planet somebody might consider that a hyper object well certainly 
you know, the nature of the phenomenon and and non-human intelligence in general and the landscape of that, he proposes is its own form of a hyper object and that and approaching it as such can help us have more understanding in the future. So it's a pretty high level book, but I'm it's a real pleasure that we were able to put it out just this last month. And we have a couple other book projects in the works. Well, one that's going to be coming up next year that we're in the works with that I'm really excited about as well that I can't announce. But oh, um, that's cool. yeah, <laughs> yeah. So there'll be there'll be some other projects in terms of like there's some other media projects. But really, it's about kind of furthering the conversation, trying to raise the level of the conversation and looking at things partially from the um, bringing more social sciences into the field, but also being able to potentially fund some hard sciences as well. Um, yeah. So, yeah. That's amazing. Does that make sense? I think it yeah. does, it does. And there was something you said in another podcast recently where it's like from when people watch other kind of UFO documentaries and stuff, where they end, this is where yours kind of carries on. And that, I, that really stood out to me. And I really oh, like yeah. that. You know, that was yeah. a really good way of looking at it. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. I'd love to amplify that. Yeah. Part of the what we've noticed with the landscape and part of the kind of germinating seed for, for the show is really that there's been kind of two camps. And on one side, you have really grounded shows um, that that show up on cable. And, you know, we know what these shows are. I don't have to name them, but they're they're great programs. And they're based largely on like proving the case. They want us. Yeah. They they want you to believe in UFOs by the time the show ends, right? And then and then there are the, there's this other camp that's completely ungrounded, where people could just like look at any you know monument in the world and say like that. Well, that was probably aliens. That was probably <laughs> aliens too. Maybe this was aliens. That was that was definitely aliens. And but they operate under the the idea that. This is there's definitely a there there. There's definitely a reality to this. And so what I what I and Kelly were talking about essentially at the beginning of this was like, how many people hate watch UFO shows? Like, why <laughs> is that a thing? Like, like how many people really sit there and go, like, this is all BS. And then by the end of the fourth episode, they're like, maybe there's something to it. You know, <laughs> most people that are watching this stuff, they they Especially what I see with frustration for a, for a lot of shows online is like, we didn't get anything new. They just showed us all the cases that are most easily proven. Like, there's nothing new. And so part of this was just like, okay, well, then let's start where the other shows end. Let's start with like, there's a reality here. And then they kind of unshackle the talent, unshackle the, the premier kind of voices within the field to to have the deeper conversations about like what does this imply about reality like what's the big picture here like how has this been hidden from us for so like why were we missing this for so long and like where are we going like what is this all leading to like those kinds of questions that really never get asked on tv right oh so that's what we're that's you know it's, it's swinging for the fences but that's what we're going to try to do it's amazing. It's much needed as well. Um, I'm just going to quickly bring up a couple of uh, images that you sent me, which just kind of shows a, a little bit of the behind the scenes and people that you've interviewed. So, you know, here we yeah. are with. Uh, yeah, that was on that was on Sunday with Alex. Yeah, she was awesome. I really enjoyed her. She she came out, by the way, partially just because um, I met her at Seoul and we got along so well. We were just like laughing hysterically. She's got a great sense of humor and we were we had so much fun that like by, by the end of the conference, by the end of the second day, she was like, I'm coming to your conference. And then, you know, within, cause she lives out in Colorado. And so, sure. uh, and so I was like, really? Okay. And then it <laughs> turned into her having the conversation. And then she shot through the show. She's really generous with her time. And I think she's brilliant. And she's still like, she's still learning so much about the field. And it's what, it's really cool to watch her grow. Sorry. Yeah. I just got to comment on these as they're happening. This is great. Wow, Thanks, that's cool. Thanks. Yeah, it was good to see because she was clearly taking notes as well from all of the other speakers, and that, that's just really good to see that people not only listening but they're taking notes to kind of take something away from it and maybe you know learn from after the event. Yeah. It's amazing, so good. Totally, super cool. Here yep. we go. 
there's there's our one of our camera operators, Kevin. He's great. And that the audio guy back there who's miking up Greg Bishop. That's Greg Bishop who wrote Project Beta back there. Yeah. Um, and uh, that guy's name is Attila, and he's like one of the coolest sound guys I've worked with in years. And I just love saying his name over and over and over again. <laughs> I love Attila's work. He also did the sound for the conference, and boy, was he, he really did a killer job. I love that guy. Amazing, so, amazing. Cool oh, look, there's the director. Hey, there's the director sitting in the deep chair. In thought. That's right. <laughs> deep in thought. Yep, looking at my questions, seeing if they actually make sense or not. You know, you can see... I definitely am a little bit disheveled and underslept. I think I had like <laughs> two and a half hours of sleep the night before that, maybe something along wow. those lines, but I did it. I yeah, did man. It. You got to pu yeah. push through, you know? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. yeah. This is great. There's Keith Taylor. I don't know if you know Keith. Keith is a, he's a retired. I do. Um, yeah, yeah. He's awesome. Keith is, yeah. Keith, I love Keith to death. And I think what he's doing is so awesome. And that's, this is another point that we're going to be bringing up in the show is like, you know, not to not to kind of like put the cart before the horse here. But what Keith is doing is so awesome. He's he's retired police. Um, he's a retired police sergeant for NYPD. He now teaches criminal justice. Uh, he's worked in SWAT teams and he was a first responder for 9-11. He did missing persons cases after 9-11. He has an extraordinary career. And then after that long career, he got into UFOs through James Fox's uh, The Phenomenon and through Leslie Kane's uh, book, UFOs, Pilots, Generals, and Government Officials Go on the Record. And he approached it, he approaches it from the mindset of a police detective. And he's wow. like, this is a huge mystery. There are crime, there are like the equivalent of crime scenes, and I got to figure this out. And nice. I think that's so cool, right? Yeah, and, definitely. And, yeah. And so along those lines, though, he's been he's been working on these presentations um, like PowerPoint presentations that, that are to give to police organizations so that they can have a better, like better formal procedures for taking reports and also being able to do things like assess with an experience or making a report, whether they're having, whether this is, is something that's really happening, whether they're reporting something or whether they're having a mental health emergency or something like that. And like, this is, this has been like absolutely necessary for a long time. And, you know, that's been part of the, the problem of the stigma of people not making reports is because they think that they're going to sound crazy. But if this, this gets baked into this like huge Byzantine hyper object of <laughs> like police departments and the criminal justice system, et cetera, and public safety within the United States, then maybe we can really get somewhere. And so there are people like Keith with his specialties and his subset that him as one man can like make a difference with a system that large. And I think that's extraordinarily inspiring and it's possibly way more inspiring than like just waiting for the government to give you one piece of information. And so we're going to focus on stories like that too. Love it. Absolutely. Yeah. Hat tip, massive hat tip to Keith. He's the, it's just such a, a great figure in the community and he, he's really putting in the work. So great yeah. that he's featured in, in your, your, your yeah. upcoming series. Oh my gosh. And here we are in Palo Alto and there's Jeff Kripal himself. This is at 5.30 in the morning. Oh my uh, goodness. What? It was so early. It was so <laughs> early. And there's Kelly was in the chair and then I was in the chair like interviewing with him. And this is in this, this is in this hotel suite in Palo Alto. Palo Alto is one of the only places what's it like actually more expensive than New York. And so it was like, it was insane getting a hotel suite to, to shoot in out there. And, right. um, and it's, a, and like, it's about as wide as you can see right there. It's, it's like, the, <laughs> it's basically this, li this living room. Of course they use these like wide angle lenses to make it look bigger online. And I figured for that, but like, we had to get like a really kind of thin footprint because this, this living room was about the size of a, a small SUV. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's tiny. <laughs> um, but we, you know, we crammed Jeff in there and we crammed, uh, Whitley and Greg Bishop and Neo Whiteley. You know, uh, out in there too, and we had a great time. It was wonderful to shoot with those folks out at Seoul, and Amazing. um, yeah, totally. And Jeff, by the way, he signed on as um, which you'll see in the full trailer that we'll release later this week. But Jeff Kripal actually signed on as a consulting producer for the show, 
So Amazing. in a similar role wow. that, yeah. So in a similar role that Leslie Kane has done for UFOs investigating the unknown in a sure. similar role that, uh, that Diana Pasolka did for the recent show encounters from, yeah. from Amblin entertainment. Jeff is going to be doing that for us, which is wow. so amazing. And so one of our next shoots is going to be going down to the archives and shooting with Jeff and other people down there in Houston, which is going to be fun. Incredible. My goodness. Yeah. Oh, look. <laughs> oh, Mike Masters. This was Mike Masters' first trip to New York City. Wow. His first trip to New York City. And there he was, like, this was on the 21st floor. It was in the shoot location that day. And he was just like, it was kind of early, you know? And he was looking out the window. And was, wow. You know, he's got like, <laughs> I've been working on my Mike Masters imp uh, impression. Like, I'm not going to do it for you guys, but like, we'll have to wait until we're offline for me to, to, to sure. try to pull out my, my pull out my mic. But I love hanging out with Mike. Mike is like one of my favorite people to hang out with, and I'm glad. You know, it's fun to like do this stuff, these these shoots and the conferences, just in terms of like doing the field of dreams thing, like totally Kevin Costnering it, and just being like, if you build it, they'll come. God right. damn it. And so then like, you know, <laughs> like not just them, but like, you know, Dan Zetterstrom came, you know, with yeah. his with this girl Elena, right? And and so many other people, you know, I there are people that came in from like Panama and and wow. and the EU and like from ridiculously far locations. And it's it's now that we've had four of those conferences just in the last 14 months, even just with this the the ones that that I've been organizing, like it's crazy because I feel like there's there's people like Kelly, Chase, and Dan, and others that I see more often than I see like my neighbors and stuff like that, <laughs> <laughs> you know. And I'm just like, oh, hey, Dan. And I just totally skip over the part where I'm like, you should be in a different country right now, but you're here right now, and I really appreciate it. Anyway, oh, it's amazing. It's, awesome. it's amazing. Think, so, you, so you mentioned there. So the trailer is coming out in the next few days. So is that going to be like on Twitter? Or where where can people find that? Yeah, out? yeah. We'll we'll post it on YouTube and we'll have it on. We'll post it on Twitter as well. And uh, I'm sure we'll probably throw it up on the Instagram too. Uh, you'll be able to find it pretty much everywhere. I, it'll be out later this week. Um, and um, I'm really excited about it. I'm really excited to see the response. We've been there's there's there you've seen it already but the, we've there we were really trying to swing for the fences and really being more inspired by really popular science programs of the past sure. like shows like cosmos and nova and shows like that um rather than just being like let's try to make something that's like better than like better looking than a lot of the ufo shows it's like no let's like let's try to like you know really raise the bar here and so, you know, for good or for ill, that's what we're doing. And, um, you know, it's a trailer. Oh, and one of the cool things, I'll mention this before we get out of here. This guy, Michael Rubino, um, he wrote in and he's been a fan of the work that I've been doing and Kelly's been doing, especially uh, lately. And he wrote in and he's this Hollywood composer and he does a lot of work for like Marvel stuff and Disney and Nickelodeon. And like he did the score for the new Dune 2 trailer and uh and wow. he did like avengers age of ultron trailers too so he's like a trailer guy and then he does scores for shows as well right and so the the score the the score for the the first trailer is like super epic and we just operated under the mindset of like let's let the dune 2 trailer guy be the dune 2 trailer guy and that's <laughs> like absolutely exactly what i did so so it'll be fun to hear what people think about it. Oh, it's amazing. The tone was great. You can already see that from the trailer. Can't wait for it to come out. Can't wait for everyone to see it. And yeah. Well, listen, Jake, nice. thank you so much, man. Uh, a of great course, conversation, man. as always. Oh, as always. I love seeing you, Vinny. It's great to have you over on the side of the pond. Thank you, man. It's a pleasure as always. Thank you to everybody watching here in the live stream. I really appreciate you Absolutely. being here. Everybody listening and watching at a later date. Again, thank you for the continued support. I love you guys so much. We'll be back next week with another guest. Follow me over on all my social medias to kind of see who that is. All of Jay's links are in the description as well. Go and follow them all and look out for this exciting new project that's coming soon. Um, so, yeah, for now, everyone, we'll see you soon. Take care. Goodbye. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.